My name is Paul Gray, and I want to thank you all for joining us here today. I want to especially thank our distinguished guest, Mr. Whitney Tolson. For those of you who don't know, Whitney is a proud founder of Case Capital. Case was an investment management firm that Whitney ran for nearly two decades with as much as $180 million under management. Today, Whitney now runs an organization called Empire Financial Research. Empire Financial Research is where Whitney develops his research and shares it with the rest of the world. In addition, Whitney is the proud author of several great books, uh, those including The Art of Value Investing and Poor Charles Almanac, both very good and I highly recommend you check it out. And I want to especially thank Lonnie for putting this event together. And with that being said, I'll let Whitney take the stage. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Paul. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, I've got 64 slides, and we're scheduled for another 40 minutes. So I'm going to be moving pretty quickly. Um, I sent Paul and the other organizers here a PDF of this, so you don't need to take snapshots of the screen or take extensive notes, because you can have these slides. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, I've given permission uh, to share them afterwards. So uh, as Paul mentioned, I was in the hedge fund business for almost 20 years. Uh, closed my fund uh, a couple years ago. I now publish investment newsletters under Empire Financial Research. Um, uh, going way back in my career. And by the way, we were having some audio difficulties and it wasn't clear whether everybody in the back could hear. If you're having trouble hearing, I'm going to try and speak loudly, but you, it, there are lots of open seats further down if you are having trouble hearing. Um, so a little bit of background on me. Uh, my parents met and married in the Peace Corps. I grew up all over the world and uh, spent half my childhood in Tanzania and Nicaragua. I uh, went to Harvard undergrad a couple years uh, later. I helped start Teach for America, worked at Boston Consulting Group. It was the only real job I've had in my entire life. Uh, I'm now 30 years out of college, so I've had a real job for two of my 30 <laughs> years post-college. So it's been a whole series of entrepreneurial ventures. Um, the first one was helping start Teach for America with Wendy Kopp way back when. Um, two years at BCG, went to Harvard Business School, uh, graduated in 94. Uh, studied uh, for the summer between years of business school and then for five years after business school I was working with Michael Porter, the guru of strategy and competitiveness that you all have probably read, you know, Five Forces, that kind of thing. Um, ran a nonprofit with him called the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, it was post LA riots, etc. Um, and then made the very logical career transition to launching my own hedge fund with a million dollars under management uh, out of my bedroom. Uh, in 1999 at the peak, almost the peak of the internet bubble. And um, my general advice to every young person seeking to follow in my footsteps is, is don't do what I did. Go, go work for, get, get trained, uh, ideally like in an analyst program at a bank or something um, that can afford to train you when you know nothing. Uh, and then see if you can get uh, move to the buy side and get a good hedge fund to bring you over there. If you're interested in picking stocks and managing money, go work for a firm that picks stocks and manages money and work there for a while, uh, you know, three to five years minimum. Uh, and then maybe, maybe you have the skills and the credibility uh, to launch your own firm and have a shot at doing it. So I launched my own fund. It's actually very easy to start a hedge fund. Somewhere between twenty dollars and $40,000 gets you set up. It requires no certifications. You don't have to pass a Series 65 or anything like that. You can... I was running a hedge fund six weeks after deciding that, hey, I should be, uh, I should be in the business. Um, and this was based on the fact that every stock I picked went up, and I thought I was God's gift to investing. <laughs> well, that was because every stock was going up, and the stupider you were, the better your returns, which, by the way, is the story of the last 10 years. So many of you probably are suffering from the same delusions that I suffered from back then. Uh, you know, I was investing in that day's equivalent of Bitcoin and other foolishness. Um, so, uh, so, you know, based on uh, what I thought was a very valid sample size of two or three years of stock picking, and most of my stocks went up, that I was therefore God's gift to investing, I should therefore launch my own hedge fund. And based on, on that set of uh, uh, flawed assumptions, uh, got into the business uh, with a million dollars from friends and family. And um, then I got lucky. I, I got lucky and I learned fast. I sat in on a class like this up at Columbia Business School, uh, taught by Joel Greenblatt, the legendary value investor. Um, he was preaching value investing at the peak of the internet bubble. This is now March of 2000. 
And uh, I had the good sense, while I was full of myself, at least I had the good sense to find good mentors and listen to them and realized that we were in an enormous bubble, the internet bubble at the time. And I owned a bunch of internet stocks. I had the good sense to sell them, not exactly at the peak, but just in time, basically, and started putting up some decent numbers. I became a value investor in the nick of time. And for 10 years, value investing really worked. Um, nailed the housing bubble, uh, went on 60 Minutes, warning everybody about it. And um, you know, 10, 12 years in, I was crushing the market. I tripled my investors' money in a flat market. I'd gone from 1 million to 200 million under management. I'm being profiled on 60 Minutes. Um, and then I fucked it all up. Um, I got very distracted, launched a conference business, a newsletter business, served on 13 nonprofit boards simultaneously. I kid you not. Uh, my daughters, three daughters were all growing up and they were great fun to be with and go to all their games and stuff like that. And uh, so, uh, and I did not build the infrastructure around me. And so, you know, a little one man operation operate, running out of my bedroom, uh, I got pulled in a million different directions, took my eye off the ball and, um, and um, basically chronically underperformed this long bull market, which has been, if the first 10 years of my career were a great time for value investing, the last 10 years have been a horrible time. Uh, long, short, classic value investing has been a really crappy place to be for the last 10 years. And after seven years of it, seven, uh, I, it was like my birthright to beat the market every year, um, which is what I did basically 11 of the first 12 years I was in business. And then I trailed the market seven years in a row. My assets dwindled down to 50 million, and I was miserable because I, I took it personally. Um, and I'd lost, my, uh, I'd lost my mojo, felt like I was letting my investors down. So I said, screw it, I'm 50 years old, and there's other things I can do with my life. And so uh, closed, that's why I closed my fund a couple years ago. Um, uh, so I've, um, I'm currently writing a book about all of this called The Rise and Fall of Case Capital, and hope to teach young people all the smart things I did, because very, very, very few funds grow from a million dollars out of somebody's bedroom with not one day of experience in the finance industry to achieve the peaks that I hit. Um, and, uh, but then equally importantly, teach young people um, the mistakes I made so that if you're fortunate enough to achieve some success, you don't give it all back like I did, basically. Not that I'm complaining about my lot in life today. Um, today I'm publishing investment newsletters and basically I get to do what I love to do. Two things that I love to do and I'm pretty good at, I think. One is, is find good investment ideas and two, write about them. Um, I, I like to write and uh, I've co-authored three books and I've got two more coming out in the next few months. Uh, so, uh, so I think I found my sweet spot um, doing, uh, and, and here's one, I'll leave you with one important les lesson before I dive into uh, this presentation, which is, if you love investing, great. That does not mean you should start your own fund. In the same reason, if you love to cook, by all means, don't start a restaurant, okay? <laughs> there are two totally different things. So the, I would estimate that 98% of the investors in this world are not investment managers. They're not managing anybody else's money. They're not running a business. They're not raising capital. They're not hiring people and managing people. They work for somebody else. Okay, I'm talking about professional investors, not the millions of people who are just managing their own money, right? So, uh, so that's another thing I wish I'd known a lot earlier. It turns out I'm much more suited to, uh, I would have been much better off spending my career working for my college buddy Bill Ackman, for example, who I probably could have finagled a job with him at Pershing Square, with, or Gotham Partners and then Pershing Square, right? So the vast majority of you who love investing and you, that's what you want to do, great, but, but you sh it should, does not necessarily follow that you should become an investment manager and start your own firm. So um, let me talk, generally speaking, uh, about short selling, which yeah, everybody comes in here and lectures about their great stock picks and you know buying Apple or Amazon 20 years ago, which by the way, I owned both of them 20 years ago, and then they went up 10% or 20%, I sold them. Kill me now, um, but that's uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, not that many people talk about short selling, and I did that for 15, the last 15 years of the 17 and three quarter years that I was professionally running a hedge fund. So I figured I'd come share some of the wisdom uh, that I accumulated uh, over over all this uh, 15 years of short selling. So let me summarize it. Uh, did it for 15 years. 
there were some incredible highs. Um, I took down lumber liquidators. I nailed the housing bubble. I nailed the internet bubble. Um, uh, I, I ended up on 60 Minutes twice uh, as a result of my short uh, ideas. Very differentiating. Um, but it's brutally difficult. And other than 18 months, uh, well, other than the collapse of the internet bubble, 18 months, and 18 months around the collapse of the housing bubble, um, the market's been going up for most of the last 20 years. And so shorting, by and large, just cost me money. I was not able to make money shorting in a bull market, uh, which is what we've been in for 80, 90 percent of the last 20 years. So my advice, uh, I'll, I'll save you all a lot of time. You can tune out and go, uh, and go back to your phones or whatever, is, is just don't do it. That's the simple advice, and that's all you need to know. Um, that's what Charlie Munger told me, as I'll tell you later. Um, but you should learn about it. So even if you're never going to short sell, and I encourage you most, most of you to never do it, you should learn about it. It's, it's, it's a useful, useful tool. Um, so um, can my screen up here is gone. Oh, hold on. Sorry if I'm screwing things up for you guys. You want to come help me? Uh, the screen went off, and I need to read off the screen so I don't have to turn around. Ah, there we go. Presentation one. Okay, good. Yep. Thank you. Um, so for the vast majority of you, don't ever short sell. If you do work for a long short hedge fund, for example, if that's your ambition, um, uh, there are some people and some funds where it does make sense. And uh, so for some of you, um, there may you may actually do it. But my advice to most of you is don't do it. Um, I actually think 11 years now, we're approaching two th March of 2009, so we're two months away from the 11th anniversary of the start of this, one of the longest, if not the longest bull market in history. Um, it's actually an okay time for short selling right now, just because there's a lot of complacency out there. But let me tell you, it's nothing like the peak of the internet bubble or the peak of the housing bubble, which were incredible times to, to be short selling. Um, uh, so lastly, I'll point out, by the way, I'm glad, even though I recommend that most of you don't do it, I think it's healthy for our markets, and I'm glad that I actually was one of the half dozen people that probably helped catalyze the rise of activist short sellers, the people who are willing to talk their book and publish reports going after companies that are fraudulent or overvalued and so forth. Um, you know, back in the day, you could count on one hand in, a, in an entire year you could count on one hand the number of people who would go public with a short thesis. Jim Chanos on Enron back in the day. Now you had Manuel Asensio for a couple of years. David Einhorn would do it once a year. Bill Ackman did it once a year, maybe. And I did it once a year, maybe, right? Um, and I think now it's every day, almost, uh, I would say, that somebody's out there anonymously or by name uh, going after companies. And I think it, it's healthy for our markets because keep in mind, 99% of what you see out there is um, Wall Street analysts and, um, and people who are long stocks pumping stocks up, right? So uh, particularly 11 years into a bull market, it's healthy out there for to have people saying that they think, hey, I think the emperor has no clothes, right? And they may be right, they may be wrong, but it's healthy. So um, uh, I'm not, uh, again, there's, these are very, I'm violating every rule of good PowerPoints by putting way too much text up here, but this is a presentation that is actually often read without me presenting it. So, uh, so well, I'm going to move very quickly through a lot of wordy slides, but, uh, but basically I started short selling a little bit back in 2002 through 2007. The market kept going up, made a ton of money in the downturn, and I thought shorting was really great, and then I stayed around way, way, way too long, and it helped uh, put me out of business, the losses on the short side. Um, had there are a handful of people who were short selling back through the uh, uh, housing bubble and then flipped around and went long and if I had simply done that and just realized you know we're in a bull market until that changes shorting is a big waste of my time and probably will cost me a lot of money uh, I did not realize that and kept shorting until the end and it helped take me out of business uh, so um, it was a combination of it cost me a lot of money uh, and it sucked up a huge amount of time uh, so, and I also think it probably made me more short-term oriented um, and led me to do more trading, which is generally deadly in investing. So here are the numbers as far back as I can go. I really wasn't doing much shorting from 02 to 07. So let me see if there's a, 
Oh, here we go. So here's 08. Um, my, in 08, the, is it the last, well, there was, the market was down, I guess, 4% in 2018, but the last really big year the market was down big was 2008. Market was down 37. My long book was down 55. My short book was up 40. I ended up down 18 in a down 37 market. This is why I thought shorting was so great. It saved my bacon in 08. Um, the first two months of 09, more of the same. My long book getting killed. My short book saving my bacon. So therefore, I was net outperforming the market. And then things turned. And you can see what happened to my long book. But I still held on to my short book. So I was still making a lot of money. Uh, my longs were, my gains on the longs were outweighing my losses on the short side. Um, but you can see the difference between the first two months of 09 and then the pivot. Um, and then I hung around and, you know, up and down. Um, Tesla killed me in 2013. Um, fortunately, I owned Netflix at the time, but it kept me from, it, 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 this is sort of, my shorting was mostly costing me money. And then at the end, when I closed my fund, you know, the market was just cranking along. My long book was doing okay. My short book was dragging me down. And I just kept underperforming the market. Very, very frustrating. Uh, so, so let me just run you through the arguments for and against shorting. To some extent, shorting is just the opposite of long, right? You're just betting a stock goes down instead of up. Um, but uh, so what do you look for on the long side? Good companies that have good cash flows, sustainable competitive advantages, good management, blah, 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 right? So you just look for the opposite on the short side. So it seems just like the opposite, right? And if you know how to do one, you can certainly do the inverse, but it's not really. Um, shorting is a much harder and more dangerous game uh, than being on the short side, uh, than being on the long side. So uh, let me just quickly bounce you through the 12 reasons not to short, and then I'll give you 10 reasons to short. You can mull on this at your leisure. So. Uh, first, most obviously, when you short something, your upside is capped, uh, your downside is unlimited. Uh, to prevent such an occurrence, you generally, um, sh I, I don't advise using stop losses on the long side generally, um, but on the short side, I didn't, but I should have uh, used stop losses uh, because otherwise um, something like Tesla can just rip from 35 to 205 against you, which is what it did in one year. Um, and uh, so, uh, so it means though, keep in mind, let's just say you're short um, a stock at 15, you think is worth five. Well, what if it bounces to 30 and then goes to five? If you do the math and you're covering at 30 to mitigate your losses, even if you're then right that it then drops from 30 to five, you've lost money. Okay, that's, that does not work that way on the long side. If you own a long at 15 bucks, it goes down to 10 bucks or seven bucks and you just hold it, you don't have to do anything. And then it goes to 30, which was your price target. You've made money uh, because you're not forced to cover, um, uh, you, you know, in the same way you're really forced to on the short side to manage risk if something's running against you. So number three, you gotta get the borrow. And shorting has become much more crowded, much more expensive, you're paying negative. You gotta get the borrow. Often you have to pay a high negative rebate to get the borrow, uh, and you're risking a short <coughs> squeeze with everybody else shorting. Um, so number four, um, lots more people are shorting, um, and that uh, just makes it harder, increases your chance of a short squeeze, raises the cost of the borrow. Um, so a short squeeze can be created if the float is suddenly uh, reduced. Uh, some of the smartest guys in the world were, had a trade where they were long Porsche and short Volkswagen, and it was a risk-free stub they were creating until Volkswagen cornered the market and the stock of Volkswagen opened up in one day. It opened up 5X. Um, it, went, it closed day one uh, at 200 and opened the next day at 1,000, and for one day, Volkswagen was the most valuable company on the planet. All the shorts were instantly squeezed out and suffered massive losses. David Einhorn sued about this. Guess how much luck he had after years of lawsuits in the German courts? Zero, uh, of course. Um, it was a manipulated short squeeze. And um, uh, so these things can happen on the short side, not on the long side generally. Um, you used to earn interest on the cash. When you short a stock, you, you hold cash while in, in exchange for selling the stock while you wait for it to go down. You used to earn, I don't know, 5% on that. Now you earn zero in today's interest rate environment, and you're generally paying a cost to borrow uh, on top of that. So 
uh, long-term upward trend of the market works against you, gains are taxed at the highest short-term rate, you generally have to make a lot more investment decisions in two ways. You need to own more positions, so that's a lot more investment decisions, and you're generally managing risk, making trading decisions on top of that. So more positions and more trades per position means you, you can sometimes in a portfolio that's 100 long and 30 short, you're making five times the number of trades on that 30% short book, right? Again, huge time suck, huge mental suck. Um, so it's a short-term, high-stress, trading-oriented style of investing, um, and time is your most precious commodity. Time and mental clarity, and shorting disrupts both. Um, mistakes become more painful as they run against you. On the long side, you screw something up, it becomes a smaller part of your portfolio. On the short side, it becomes a bigger part of your portfolio, and that cre can create big problems. Um, and lastly, if you go public, this risk has become sl uh, massively less than it was back in the day, where any time you went public with a short thesis, you could assume the company would sue you and the SEC and Elliott Spitzer would come after you. It's happened to me. Uh, um, but these days, they're now, it's so common, and short sellers have been proven right so many times that uh, those risks are less, though they are not non-existent. Um, so, so why would anybody do this crazy activity? Um, number one is, is I do know people who've made money shorting over time and even made money shorting last year. You know, if you shorted dying retailers, you made money last year on the short side, right? So, uh, so it is possible. I did not do it, but uh, I wasn't as good at it as some people, very few that I know. Um, so, um, every investor has a long book, but only a few shorts. So, developing a well-articulated bearish thesis on a company or industry is a great way to, uh, for an emerging manager to make a name for himself or herself. Uh, both as an analyst, you want to get hired by a long short fund. You come in and pitch a well-articulated short idea, you're more likely to get the job. If you are running a fund and looking to make a name for yourself, um, you'll get more attention uh, if you've got a great short idea. Um, you might get, you're more, much more likely to get invited to speak at a big conference, et cetera, et cetera, as an emerging manager. So, um, and it really worked for me. It's, it made um, nailing the internet bubble, nailing the housing bubble, massively increased my profile, which led to a lot of people hearing about me and how I grew my assets from a million to a hundred million. I mean, yes, it was putting up good numbers and writing good letters, et cetera, but the shorting really helped. Um, here's a, one thing to keep, uh, keep in mind, which is, I showed you a few slides ago, attribution on the long and the short side, and it seems like, okay, you just add it up. But in fact, having a short book enables you to invest more aggressively on the long side because you've got some insurance, right? So the way to think about shorting isn't just looking at your short returns, but saying, look, if, if having a short book that costs me five percentage points of return this year led me to invest bigger and in certain cyclical sectors or whatever on the long side, and I made an extra 10 points of return on the long side, well, I'll take that trade all day long, right? So think about that. It's, maybe it's a cheap rationalization for continuing to lose money on the short side, but it may, you know, one of the reasons I held, I, I made seven times my money on Netflix. And I sold way too early because it then went up another 7x after I sold as a 50 bagger from the lows in uh, 2012. Um, and ever selling a share of that uh, was, uh, was my, probably my most financially costly mistake in my career. Um, but even, I was tempted to sell it after it doubled, right? The stock just made me nervous, right? It was hard to value, didn't have current cash flows, whatever. One of the reasons I actually stayed in for a seven bagger, which you know, no, no, which I'll take all day, right, is is because I was short Tesla. So I lost a bunch of money on Tesla, but I made more money on Netflix. And you could argue they were sort of the two horsemen. And by the way, the same investors owned both, right? So Tesla was actually a pretty good hedge for for Netflix if something came and shook the markets and caused speculation, speculative investors to sell a lot of things they owned. Tesla, you know, having that Tesla short. So similarly, you know, my single best investment in my career, the shortest, fastest amount of money I ever made was General Growth Properties, a bankrupt mall REIT that Bill Ackman got into. And I went to his investor dinner in January of 2019. And he said he was buying the equity in bankruptcy at as low as 32 cents a share. And I said, damn, that's pretty. And he said there's gonna be recovery for the equity. 
The, the company was forced to file for bankruptcy not because it was insolvent, i.e. that the liabilities exceeded the assets. It's that the assets were malls, cash flowing malls, so they couldn't make the debt payments. So it was illiquidity, not insolvency, that caused the bankruptcy. And there's a huge difference between the two. Because in bankruptcy, debt holders are only entitled to get back their debt. Okay, they're not entitled to just take the whole company. So if the assets actually exceed the liabilities, there can be recovery for the equity if there's someone in there fighting for the equity. And I saw, okay, Bill Ackman's in there fighting for the equity, and he's a pretty damn litigious, deep-pocketed guy. So um, I bought a million shares of general growth properties, an average price is 67 cents. So I was managing over $100 million, so this was less than a 1% position. By the end of the year, it was up 17x to 1150 a share. And the company was still in bankruptcy. It had exited a few months later in 2010. But the point here is, is so it's interesting. I didn't sell a single share. And by the time that little 1% position, by the time it went up 17x, was like a 15% position in my fund. And, but I was like, I'm gonna hang, hang in here. This story's playing out. And there's a pretty good case that the equity's worth 20. Ended up being bought by Brookfield for more than 20. Um, so why did I hang around is, is I shorted Mesa Rich and Simon Properties and other mall companies such that if there were another shock, keep in mind, this is 2009, things were still pretty dicey, even as the economy was showing signs of recovery. So again, my short book cost me some money that year, but it kept me in a monster, my biggest winner ever on the long side. So think about that. Um, that a short book you need to think of in the context of your long book as well. So, uh, number four, a short book pays off when you need it. When stocks are getting killed, when there's blood in the streets, when your investors are thinking of redeeming, uh, a short book enables you to lose less money than the market generally, mitigates the losses, and it generates cash. Okay, because you understand, when you short a million dollars worth of a stock, there's a million dollars of cash sitting in your bank account, right? Now let's say that stock, the market gets hit, that stock drops by 50%. $500,000 of that million has just become unencumbered cash that you can then take and buy cheap stocks on the long side, which is exactly what we did in 08 and early 09, right? So it keeps you in business during hideous market downturns. Most of you look like you were in diapers about back then, right? But trust me, markets can go down, okay? It will happen at some point. So. Um, a short book will help you survive and even thrive and make you a ton of money. So again, if you told me I'm gonna lose two or 3% a year on the short side and then help me make 20 or 30%, both on the short side and on the long side into a big downturn, right? I, I take that deal all day long. I can tell you though, it's pretty miserable losing money year in and year out as the bull market keeps going. And by the way, I was losing more than two or three points a year, right? So. Um, so number five, um, buying some insurance. Uh, so you guys buy insurance. Let's say you insure your house and you pay the check on January 1st. If the house doesn't burn down at the end of the year, you have just wasted your money, right? All right, now are you sad that your house didn't burn down and you wasted your money? No, that's what insurance is, right? So again, that's an argument for having some shorts out there, right? Um, and number six, this starts to get into the real reason I stuck around shorting way too long is, is it's a lot of fun, and man, when you're right on the short side, it's at least five, if not 10 times more fulfilling than making a dollar on the long side. Because uh, it's so contrarian, and often you're going to battle publicly with uh, scummy management and a crooked company, right? So man, I love those battles. Intellectually, it was so stimulating, right? So, so it was irrational and illogical for a one got one person operation for most of my career without an analyst or anything to be active on the short side uh, but one of the reasons i stayed in it was is it was a lot of fun um, so number seven why should you short maybe a little bit is is it helps you develop the mentality of a short seller it'll help you from falling into traps on the long side you, you just develop a nose, you're a little, uh, uh, for fraud, you're a little more skeptical of promotional management and all of that. Um, so um, it put us in the flow of short ideas. Uh, so we often heard about problems with companies. I, I, it saved my bacon a few times on the long side when I was in something on the long side. And, uh, but I had a network of short sellers. And you know, somebody called me up and they're like, Whitney, are you crazy? The stock's a fraud, you know, whatever, got out. Uh, so you don't have to be a short seller in order to get those calls, but it helps. You're more likely to get it if you're in the flow, right? Um, 
Um, number nine, I'm not sure whether it's an argument for or against shorting, but shorting took up a bunch of time and attention. Now, to, that's a good thing if it, if it keeps you entertained. Because look, everybody who runs a hedge fund is a person of action, right? It's very, very hard for these type A people like me to just sit on their hands for year after year, even though that's what you should do. Right? So the short book sort of kept me entertained. Right? Um, it's like Warren Buffett has his own little personal account that he monkeys around with and you, know, you can read about it in, on the blogs and the filings. But Charlie Munger sort of scoffs and says that ah, it keeps him from, from doing something dumb with our main portfolio. Right? <laughs> that argument has some validity. On the other side though is, is it can also mess with you and cause you to become more short term and trading oriented which can cause you know, bad thinking that, that then screws up the rest of your portfolio. So yeah, my, I had experienced sort of a both. Um, and lastly, here's a very practical thing. If you're starting up a hedge fund, you decide you want to be a hedge fund, not separately managed accounts or something like that, and you're going to be long only, good luck charging hedge fund fees, right? It's hard enough to get hedge fund fees in, in this low fee world where there's a lot of pushback on fees. If you're not doing any shorting at all, then people are like, well, you're not a hedge fund, you're not hedging. Right? Now look, some guys like Bill Ackman, when you're Bill Ackman, uh, and have a long track record on the long side anyway, to say, you know, we're just not going to do any shorting, um, and, uh, and, that's, uh, and he can get away with it. But most hedge funds can't. Um, if you just want to pick stocks on the long side, then you're probably not going to be able to charge hedge fund fees. And hedge fund fees, they suck if you're an investor. They're really good if you're the GP, the general partner, right? There's no better deal in the world then somebody else puts up all the money. You get 20% of the ups, even if you're just riding a bull market, not, not even outperforming. How many guys last year, and sadly 99% are guys, that's a whole other topic, uh, for a guy with three daughters, figuring out why there are almost no women in this industry is another interesting topic I've written about. Um, but, so how many guys last year made big money running big funds, and I'd say 5% of them did better than the S&P 500's 31.5% with dividends returned last year, and they were up 10, 15, 20% and pocketed tens of millions of dollars for underperforming the market by 20 points, right? It's a freaking great deal if you can get it, but you probably need to need a short book if you're gonna charge 20% fees, right? So, um, I'm now gonna start flying through this, uh, having taken way too much time uh, on this. So the general, general lesson here is, is for certain investors in certain circumstances, Shorting makes sense. For the vast majority of investors, learn about it, study it, read short reports, and don't ever do it. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense for most people. So um, here's some wise advice. Don't get sucked in for the wrong reasons. Um, it was This is one of my friends who emailed me and just said, who ran a hedge fund. He had a $2 billion hedge fund. And he trailed the market just like I did. He made retirement money, and I didn't. Uh, you know, before went back. He got he got big back in the good 12 years, and made retirement money. And then he same thing, drip torture like me, kept kept shorting. And he admits it was sort of an emotional thing. The joy of an individual short working um, uh, is easy to focus on that and not recognize the poor return on time, effort, and capital. And this is a guy running well over a billion dollars. So another friend uh, noted, like, look, if you're going to short sell, it should be something that you like. Um, you know, some people are like, oh, I sort of have to do it and all. But, you know, the good short sellers are just willing to dig in. And, you know, they, they you know, as, as this friend of mine said, most of my Tiger Cub friends despise their short book. They view it as a necessary evil to run a hedge fund and charge hedge fund fees. Right? That's a crappy reason to do something, you know. Uh, um, uh, so, so the best short sellers are people who really love it. They, the best short sellers tend to be total lunatics, by the way. <laughs> um, just look at them. Um, so, Charlie Munger. I got in trouble on one of my first shorts. Bill Ackman and David Einhorn and Guy Spear and I were in Farmer Mac and MBIA. And MBIA planted a story in the Wall Street Journal um, that, that resulted in the SEC and Spitzer investigating me. And it was, it was in the Wall Street Journal. My name was being dragged through the mud. It was a miserable experience. I thought I might go out of business as a result. Um, so I called up Buffett and he said, yeah, this too shall pass. Why don't you call Charlie? So I called up Charlie 
And he said, I still remember, I haven't had a lot of conversations with him over the years, and I still remember, he said, you know what, you and Bill are exactly right on MBIA. The, the idea that anyone would ever think that company is AAA, a real AAA rated company, is so ludicrous, he shouted into the phone. And then I'm like, damn, okay, Charlie Munger's agreeing with my analysis right here, right? And he said, from a societal perspective, what you and Bill are doing, making it public, that this company isn't really a AAA company, is doing all sorts of fraudulent things. I think it's great from a societal perspective. And I'm feeling even better. And then Charlie's like, but you know what? My advice to Whitney Tilson is don't do it. If you go through life stepping on people's air hoses, they're gonna hate you, right? And that's what we were doing. We were stepping on MBIA's air hose. Their AAA rating was, their business would not exist without that rating. Which by the way, is definitionally means something cannot be AAA if it's such a flimsy company that if they just got downgraded to double A, they literally are out of business, right? It, it, it's like a, tata, a tautology, right? But there we go, MBA was triple A and, and the stock went up and up and up for years and then it went from 74 to two, you know, back in the financial crisis. Um, so Charlie Munger told me, but then at the end of our conversation, he said, you know what? So he said, my advice to you, Winnie, is don't do it. But then he said, you know what? Every young guy seems to need to learn this for himself. He was, he was more saying it to himself. He knew I wasn't going to listen to him because I was just a young jackass. <laughs> so, lessons. Look for an edge. Where I made money shorting is where I had some sort of proprietary insight. Where I lost money shorting is Salesforce just seems overvalued and, uh, and they don't generate any free cash flow. And that was sort of my thesis. I had no edge. Never used the product. Right? And, I, and uh, I had way too many of those and way too few uh, cases like lumber liquidators where you know really, really, really nailed it because I had a source in China, I took the story to 60 Minutes, I knew they were doing a piece on it, whatever, right? You gotta have an edge, long or short. It's especially important on the short side because you get killed if you're wrong. So how do you mitigate risk on the short side in a bull market? You gotta be extra focused on catalysts. It's not good enough to just say, oh, it's overvalued, something bad's gonna happen someday, right? You don't wanna be short an insurance company that's underpricing hurricanes, uh, hurricane insurance in Florida, because until the hurricane hits, it's the most profitable business on earth, right? They collect premiums and have no payouts, right? But one day it'll go bankrupt, but who, who are we to predict when that hurricane's gonna come, right? So for years and years, you just sit there and get killed, right? So, uh, so you got to think about catalysts on the short side. Um, now, one way to be a catalyst, uh, one catalyst, obviously, they're going to blow earnings, going to miss expectations. Great catalyst if you can foresee that, if you can really develop insight. Um, you can, um, uh, and another way is to be your own catalyst. You do the research and you publish it, and uh, that's so. What that is called, what I call guerrilla shorting which is you're not in there for a long extended Bill Ackman Herbalife campaign. You're in there for a relatively short period where you think you have done research that will cause the, the, other, the collective investors in the world to re-rate that stock based on new information that you've developed. And so you put on a big short position, you put your information out there, hopefully the stock re-rates and you're out. It's just a relatively short term trade. Um, there are a half dozen people I know who do this and who do it pretty well. Um, and the, you have to be super careful though because this looks like market manipulation. It's a short term trade around your own, t you tearing down a company, right? So you better be really careful about your research because companies don't like this and can sue you and you're gonna turn over your trading records and they're not, there better not be any email to you between you and your analyst saying, yeah, this company's actually a pretty good company, but I think we can knock the stock down five or 10% uh, if we publish this bullshit tomorrow, right? You're gonna go to jail for that, okay? But if you genuinely believe it, if it's good quality work, there no, there's no law that says you can't short-term trade around your own work versus long-term trade around it, right? But be careful, the, the optics of it don't look very good. I never did this, but, but I went out of business because of shorting. I know people who made a lot of money doing guerrilla shorting. So um, let's talk about three types of shorts where we, have, we did not have much success over the years. Total frauds, boiler room, pump and dumps, right? Like in Wolf of Wall Street. Chinese companies, of the 400 companies that went public, uh, Chinese companies that went public via reverse mergers in about 2010, 11, 399 were total frauds and went to zero. 
Okay? I did not have good luck shorting those, even though I know people who did. So secondly, just generally overhyped sectors, cryptos, cannabis, 3D printing, alternative power, um, and then market darlings trying to shorten Tesla and Netflix, uh, you know, and all. Never had that much luck, even though we were probably right. We were right most of the time. When we were wrong, we really got killed. And so net, net, very difficult. Um, so where did we have short, uh, success on the short side? Shorting melting ice cubes, generally, dying businesses, um, where they were valued on a multiple of earnings, and the company's earnings went down and down and down. Okay, Bed Bath & Beyond, Barnes & Noble, paging companies, pr check printers, uh, mall-based retailers, right? Uh, uh, some of these pharmaceutical stocks like Insys and um, Mallinckrodt, one of the most disgusting companies in history. Um, so, uh, Valiant, of course. Uh, so, um, so, generally these were not the beloved, we, we weren't sh shorting rocket ships, nor were we shorting companies on the verge of bankruptcy. It was companies that were in the second highest um, quartile, but moved down to the third and then eventually to the fourth, dying businesses. So a friend of mine recently, this is a new slide I just put in this presentation, said, yeah, we spent, you know, he, he ran an $8 billion Tiger Cub hedge fund. Um, so he did, he did shorting for 20 years, and made good money, he was very, very good at it. And he and his analysts, even though he was mostly long, spent 70% of the time on the short side, because that's where they really differentiated themselves. And he said, look, it was easy just finding stocks that would go up, good growth companies, right? Um, so he said, when I analyzed our performance on the short side, we made 200% of our cumulative lifetime of our fund profits, 200% on stocks that went to zero. Which means, I don't know, he made a billion dollars shorting stocks collectively. He made two billion dollars shorting stocks that went to zero, and he lost a billion on all his other shorts combined. Okay? If you don't think a stock's going to zero, don't short it. That's what he would say. And by the way, if you think a stock's going to zero, it gets halfway there, and then something happens, something turns around, new development, whatever. Um, and you come to believe it is not going to zero, you gotta get out. That's the mistake my short selling friends made on Tesla. Okay, Tesla was on its way to zero earlier this year. I was telling my readers it's a good short at 300, it went to 178, and then things started to stabilize. They got that plant built in, uh, built in China faster than anyone could have imagined. Their sales stabilized, and then they reported a, a, a profit in the third quarter, and the stock bounced that day right back to about 300. And at that, that day, you had to get out of your Tesla short. It stopped being a good short because there was no chance of a zero at that point. Okay, whatever you think about Tesla long or short, it ain't going bankrupt. And it could have gone bankrupt as recently as six months ago. Elon Musk has, has said that, right? At multiple points in the past few years, Tesla could have gone bankrupt. I would argue with a $100 billion market cap today, that's off the table. If they run into any trouble now, they just issue stock with a $100 billion market cap. How many $100 billion market cap companies can you list in, in ever in history have ever gone bankrupt. Valiant got close to, I don't know, it was at 70 billion. It went to 1 billion. The stock went down by 97%. Um, but it didn't go bankrupt, even with 30 billion of debt, right? So, um, so again, gosh, we're running out of time, and I still got a lot of slides here. So stocks follow earnings. Doesn't matter how right you are about a company. If uh, the earnings keep going up, that stock's gonna keep going up. Stocks follow earnings. I can give you so many examples. So here's lumber liquidators. The stock ran up big when earnings rose. As earnings went down, the stock went down by 90%. The 3D printing bubble, 3D systems went up 90%. As, but earnings went up a lot, um, and then earnings crashed. The stock, um, the stock crashed by 90%. It went up 10x, then went down by 90%. Bed Bath and Beyond, what a chart of stock, a stock following earnings. The the red bars are trailing 12 month operating income, and the blue bar is the stock price. Um, Valiant, now this is just with a lot of leverage, but Valiant stock went up 20x in six years to its peak. But guess how much earnings went up? Operating income went up 14x. So it wasn't trading at some super high valuation even at its peak, because earnings had been rising very rapidly as well. But then the gig, the gig was up, making acquisitions, jacking up prices, et cetera, and then with leverage, stock went down by 97%. Look at Crocs, they're multiple, you know, the little rubber shoes that my daughters used to love and wear and stuff. There was a fad back here, 
Um, and the stock went from 72 to one. Um, but then they stabilized and earnings recovered and the stock went to 30 bucks. Went from one to 30, it was a 30 bagger. And then, you know, earnings went back down and the stock went back down. But look, earnings recovered, right? Stocks follow earnings, 90 plus percent of stocks. You look at them over a long, extended period of time and that stock, depending on whether there's how much debt there is, it can be a levered return up and down. But basically, if you're right on a company's long-term earnings and what happens to earnings, you'll be right on the stock. So how do you find, if on the short side, how do you find collapsing earnings? I'm gonna really start going faster now to get us through this. Uh, we'll be here all night. Um, so the eight reasons, the eight ways I've found over the years that will trigger a company's earnings to go down a lot, which is what you're looking for on the short side. Um, unsustainable or illegal business practices, a business made obsolete, a business model made obsolete by technology, um, everybody getting Amazon, um, Netflix's DVD by mail business, blockbuster video, newspapers, et cetera. Number three, accounting fraud. Number four, legal and regulatory scrutiny. Often those two are related. Um, a wave of new competition. Um, um, number six, aftermath of one-time events. Sometimes companies, their earnings are pumped up by one-time events. A hurricane triggers big sales for lumber liquidators that juiced, that juiced it. Um, even without the formaldehyde problem that I exposed, um, you can sometimes, uh, there's many examples I can give, but um, you know, their long-term earnings spike up due to some one-time event and comes back down. Um, amazing how investors sometimes don't see that. Um, cyclical companies over-earning at the peak of a cycle or sometimes due to sort of random industry events, you know, there's a big, uh, there's a fire at a uh, factory that accounts for 20% of the world's supply of widgets or something, so prices go up. Everybody in the industry makes a lot of money, but then they, the factory comes back online six months later. Um, and fads coming to an end, like Crocs. So, um, one of the most frustrating things about short selling is, is if you are too smart, if you figure something out before everybody else, but not six months before, but like a year or two before, and you're exactly right about what's gonna happen, but you figured it out too early, before the, uh, something collapses, and you get in on the short side, you just sit there and get pounded. So look at, um, you guys read the big short, Mike Burry, the one-eyed uh, guy with autism and all, a good friend of mine back in the day. And he almost went out of business buying the single greatest investment of my lifetime that I've ever witnessed, I was never in it, was credit default swaps on any subprime financial whatever back in the day. There's uh, Z Greg Zuckerman, the guy who wrote the recent book on Jim Simons, one of his earlier books called The Greatest Trade Ever. And that's a little bit like the big short, but plenty of friends of mine made anywhere from 50 to 200 times their money buying a small piece of credit default swaps. <coughs> Um, in this would have been 2006, 2007. John Paulson made three billion dollars on this trade. Um, Mike Burry figured it out two years before everybody else did, and credit default swaps are decaying instruments. He almost went out of business. His investors mutinied at what he did, and he was absolutely right. Um, when it finally paid off, he made 700 million. He should have made three and a half billion but his investors had mutiny and he was forced to cover because he, was, he, he figured it out before anybody else. And not only figured out the housing bubble was gonna burst, but he figured out the exact right way to play it, not shorting the stock, but buying credit default swaps on it, which is an exponential levered return, right? It's really, really, really frustrating to be right on something and still get clobbered. So other things on the short side, look for obvious bubbles. These are the 3D printing companies. I was short all of them. Um, alternative power promotions, I was short all of them. By the way, Ballard Power is a pretty darn good short right now. These stupid things bounce every few years. They've been, they've been around for 20 years. Obvious frauds or promotions um, that do nothing but lose money, but they issue stock every few years when they pump their stocks up. Ballard Power is back over 10 bucks, it's insane. It has a $2 billion market cap for this rinky-dink little company that makes hydrogen-powered forklifts that manage to lose money on every one of them that it's ever built. It's insane. Um, most of the rest of these are close to zero. Um, avoid valuation shorts, okay? Just looking at something saying it's overvalued is a horrible short thesis. 
Look for accelerating growth on the long side. Avoid accelerating growth. You see, you can short growth stocks, okay? Companies that are growing do never ever short accelerating growth, where the company was growing 20% a year year over year last year, and this year it's growing at 30% a year. Okay, look at Adobe uh, as accelerating growth. So the red line is year over year revenue growth rate. And you can see the, the growth rate over on the right side, the right axis, went down and down, and then the growth rate took off from 5% to 10%, 15 to 20%, and stayed north of 20% a year, right? That's a horrible short. By the way, a great long. Look for accelerating growth on the long side. Look at Netflix's growth rate. This was back when the stock went from 300. That's, believe it or not, that's 300 pre a seven for one split. This is a 80% decline, 300 to 53, because the growth rate was slowing. Notice it never went negative. Netflix was still growing, but then the growth rate accelerated, and the stock from here to here is a 50 bagger in six years. The stock of the decade. Amazon, um, look at what the stock did as growth accelerated. And there are a lot of people short this. Um, they got massacred and deserve to, um, frankly. Um, so generally don't short companies with insanely loyal and happy customers. Green Mountain, Netflix, Starbucks, Lululemon, Costco, Southwest Airlines. Um, don't own stocks. Don't short stocks owned by irrational investors. Yeah, no, yeah I'll uh, crank here. So. Um, be careful of irrational acquirers, certain places, uh, certain sectors, like little biotechs, uh, um, little tech companies. Um, yeah, it's very frustrating being right on the stock and then getting taken out by a big, dumb competitor. Uh, so don't use options. Oh my gosh. Everyone's like, oh, Whitney, I've got to. Have you ever thought about buying a put option because, as opposed to shorting a stock? Because then. Um, your upside is unlimited and your downside is capped, right? So you've now inverted it. You're now long a security, so you've avoided that. Well, that's all well and good. Yes, I understand that math. The problem is, is you now have to be right on the timing, okay? And something like two-thirds of all options that are ever purchased expire worthless, right? So basically, um, in your effort to mitigate one type of risk, you're taking on another type of risk, uh, which is you're now taking on timing risk. In addition to having to be right on the stock, which is really, really hard, you now have to be right that it's gonna move before your option expires. So look, buying five-year credit default swaps wasn't unreasonable. Burry still made out like a bandit and all. Um, the only, um, I've never bought any put options. Um, um, because also, by the way, the things you really worry that could run against you pretty rapidly on the short side, tend to have very high volatility, which means the options are super expensive, right? So the only, um, the only time I've ever used options, and it worked out pretty well, was low volatility blue chip companies where I was buying five year, I had custom written five year in the money options. So um, Canadian Pacific was at 100 bucks under Hunter Harrison, who'd just come in. The stock had run up from 50 to 100, but I thought Hunter Harrison still had a couple years more to go on the turnaround. So I bought five-year 80 strike options, and sure enough, stock went to 200, and I made a leveraged return. So I owned, I don't know, a 3% position in the stock, and I bought a 2% option position on top of it. So it sort of looked like an 8% position, but sometimes those kind of options are fairly inexpensive because it's a low vol blue chip stock. So the people selling you the options, their Black Scholes model, low volatility means they'll sell you, they'll sell you for pretty cheap. Um, so, so that can work, but don't use options on the short side. Um, they, as one of my friends, one of my favorite quotes of all time said, Whitney, options are like heroin. They feel so good, but they will kill you. <laughs> Keep that in mind. So uh, don't be afraid of other, uh, if, you, if you are gonna short, just because uh, management's buying some stock or because other smart investors are long it, assume that is gonna be the case. If you're gonna short sell, assume that there's gonna be some smart, well-credentialed, you know, Bill Miller or somebody long Kodak, and he's just wrong. Uh, you know, Rich Pizzina, who I really respect, you know, was long Fannie Mae and was long Lehman and AIG, was long all the financials, the smartest value investors in the world. Basically, we're all wrong. The big guys were all wrong on the financials going into the financial crisis. They didn't realize that this time really was different, right? So that said, you should pay a lot of attention if a smart investor is getting in on the long side. Um, 
So um, try to match your long and your short positions. It's very dangerous being long a portfolio of Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, Visa, you know, some blue chip long portfolio, maybe some Amazon or some Apple, and then be short a bunch of little micro cap biotechs or something, right? Because there are markets in which big cap stuff doesn't work and little crazy stuff rips upward and um, you could be put out of business, right? So, um, so it, it, I always actually sort of tried. If I could be short something like Tesla, okay, I'm gonna look to be long something like Netflix. Same kind of investors, same kind of profile, right? If I'm gonna be short IBM, offsetting, I might be long, <coughs> Yeah, uh, Google or Berkshire Hathaway or some sort of blue chips, you know. So think about balancing your portfolio because um, I've seen guys go out of business in the short term, even if they're right in the long term. So don't forget to cover. I am. I just had a conference call today. Shoot me now because I'm short Lehman Brothers and cannot cover it. And I closed my fund two years ago, and Goldman will not let me close my fund. And they are holding on to $170,000 of my money because I never covered 78,000 shares of Lehman Brothers. So if you short a stock to zero and the thing's on the pay sheets, buy it for a penny a share and cover your short. Because if that thing stops trading on the pink sheets and the stock is not liquidated by a court, which has not yet happened, believe it or not, with Lehman stock, you are screwed. Uh, it's, it's the most irritating thing in my entire career that I'm still farting around with this. My hands are tied. There's nothing I can do until the Lehman bankruptcy trustee, who God knows when, 10 years, we're now 12 years in, and they're still farting around. So um, lastly, where do you look for short ideas? Other short sellers, develop networks, invest in conferences. Value Investor Insight is the old newsletter I used to run. Um, Value Investors Club, you can, even if you're not a member, um, you can sign in as a guest and access older short ideas, many of which have run up, so they're a better short now than they were when they were posted. A lot of smart people. I'd say Value Investors Club, long and short ideas, the single best source of ideas that I'm aware of out there. Um, it's, it's curated. Keep in mind, the only people who can post ideas are the 5% or less of people that Joel Greenblatt and John Petrie, two old friends of mine, have, have selected. It's a very selective process, so there are no bozos. And anyone who is a bozo gets kicked off the site. So you can, um, I encourage you all to become members if you can, but most of you will not be able to because it's very selective. But you can, if you just give them your email address, you can access things on a 30-day delay. And even if you don't give them your, right now, just log in and you can access ideas on a 45-day delay. And a lot of these ideas, you know, don't work immediately. So there's plenty of time to get in on the short. But also, if you want to learn how to think and uh, look for the highly rated ideas. And on the website, you can say, give me the five highest rated ideas, whatever. And if you can crank out well-articulated, succinct ideas, like the people on Value Investors Club, like the highest rated ideas, you will be able to find a job in the, on the buy side, right? If you, can, if you can do what the people on Value Investors Club are doing. So, so it's, a, it's a great website. And um, I was one of the first members you, you know, when they started 20 years ago. Um, there's a good website called Activist Shorts. If you pay 5,000 bucks a year, they'll track every short Activist Short campaign. Uh, Seeking Alpha and Sum Zero have some good write-ups as well, long and short. Um, three of the sh Activist Short sellers out there that you can sign up for their websites and when they publish stuff is Andrew Left at Citron, um, and then Spruce Point, um, and uh, Karisdale is Sam Adrangi. Um, so those are, those are where I get good short ideas. And by the way, many of these are where I get good long ideas as well, um, have, having good filters and knowing where to look. So, um, oh, and I wrote these articles. When I send this to you, um, if you get the hard copy, just click those links. And um, here's some of the advice in writing that I've just given you verbally. So conclusions. And, uh, and then, by the way, we're, I'm going to stop here, take some questions, and then we'll break. Um, I've included in this presentation uh, a short pitch that's slightly updated from what I pitched at the Robinhood conference for Uber, which I think is a pretty good short, even though I don't think it's going to zero at this point, but I think uh, um, it's a pretty good short, and I've got 20 odd uh, slides um, that you can review at your leisure. Um, it was up 7% today. The stock's been sort of on a tear from the mid-20s to the mid-30s. It went public at 45, um, so it's down from where it went public, but it's been on a tear recently. Um, so I think that sets it up to be another uh, another good time to short it right now. Um, 
So, uh, so conclusions, shorting is really difficult. You gotta size things small um, and aggressively manage risk like stop losses and so forth. Um, focus on stocks valued based on earnings and then earnings collapse, ideally to zero. Look for zeros, things you think are long-term zeros. Um, look for multiple ways to win, not just because the valuation is higher, whatever, though that's nice. Companies or industries in secular decline, fad coming to an end, leverage financial distress, all the other, all those eight reasons that cause companies' earnings to decline. Be patient. Don't try and be a hero. If a stock is ripping upwards, okay, you don't have to try to nail the top. There's almost always plenty of time on the downside after they've blown a quarter and the stock's down 20%. You haven't missed it if you're right on the fundamentals, right? So, uh, so I, I generally find that it's much better to miss the first 20% of the downside on the backside of a stock collapsing than to try and you know, nail it at the top, but end up getting killed as the stock rips up another 20 or 50 or 100% uh, by getting in too early. So uh, be patient, don't try and be a hero and wait for until the fundamentals are actually shifting, okay? Shorting an insurance company because they've underpriced their, this is an actual company called UVE is the ticker. Anyone want to look that up? Universal something? Um, if any, if, uh, yell it out if, uh, if you can refresh my memory on it. But uh, one of the smart. Insurance holdings? Yes. What, say it again? Universal insurance holdings. Universal insurance holdings. Um, Anthony Bozo of Lakewood Capital runs a few billion dollars. Um, he's one of the smartest short sellers I know. Every year he pitches an incredible short idea or two at the Robin Hood Conference. Um, and he has great track record doing so. It was one of his picks years ago, and it has not worked. Um, and the reason is, is it's an insurer that will go bankrupt. I believe he makes an airtight case that it will go bankrupt um, with the next time there's a super cat hurricane in Florida. Uh, they only write hurricane insurance in Florida. Um, but the problem is, is there, haven't, there hasn't been one in 10 years. So this stupid company just keeps ripping along, um, and it's very irritating, right? So you, it, that's a hard one. It's a hard one because, you know, what you're waiting for is something that statistically will happen, but who knows when. And in the meantime, you're paying cost to borrow, you're paying the dividend. When you're short something, that means you have to pay the dividend in addition to any cost to borrow, right? So, um, uh, be, you know, being patient and um, just short the stock. Don't use options because that by definition is impatience, right? Because now timing's working against you and try and balance your long and short book. So with that, uh, do we have time for any questions? Um, and uh, this is the teaser slide to Uber, which, uh, which you all will have to read on your own. It looks like that. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm Misha from Poland, and I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, when you are saying that um, the company's value is going to zero, yeah. what do you mean by the company's uh, value is going to zero? Because um, I think uh, our modern business is ba based on the concept that um, of the green concern. So when you, when you are saying that the business value is going to zero, you, you actually mean the death, you are declaring the death of the company. So in the foreseeable future, it will no longer exist. Yeah, um, that's what you're looking for. Yeah, the, the, you are sitting on the other side of the market. Well, you're sitting on the opposite side of a lot of people hustling to try and keep that company alive, right? And in pretty loose debt markets, not that many companies are going to zero. But look at the whole mall-based retail sector, um, for example. It'll be interesting to see whether something like Bed Bath & Beyond goes to zero. Um, but there, uh, there are um, a lot of smaller mall-based retailers, like Chico's FAS is... Uh, mall based retail it really has no reason to exist stocks down 50% uh, in the past year in a bull market uh, one of my short selling friends who specializes in retail and consumer said she had a 75% hit rate win rate on her short book last year and only like 50% on the long book um, in a plus 30 market that's super unusual but it's because she's got a good nose for dying retailers um, so there are plenty of them out there GameStop uh, you know, historically, obviously, you know, Circuit City, um, uh, Borders, um, etc. But, you know, not all of them go to zero. Uh, and sometimes you get bounces. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond has had a bounce. Uh, 
Another one that's being, another one that's I think intriguing uh, is at home, H-O-M-E is the ticker. It's, uh, it's sort of like Bed Bath & Beyond or the Container Store or whatever. They're trying to be restoration hardware, which has gone parabolic <coughs> uh, because it's pretty differentiated. <coughs> but uh, so you could, uh, um, whether they'll all go to zero, but some of the fraudulent pharma companies that had fraudulent business models, Valiant almost went to zero, um, Insys did go to zero. Unclear if Malincrot's actually going to zero. Um, uh, uh, these companies that were, um, that are caught up in the opiate, that were front and center of the opiate epidemic, um, the, the legal liability they occurred in, in their role in the opiate epidemic uh, will probably bankrupt some of them. Teva Pharmaceuticals is uh, it's super high risk there. Malincrot uh, is at super high risk. And the ones that have a lot of debt See, the, the business doesn't even necessarily actually have to go to zero. It's just that the debt holders are on the company and they refinance, the debt takes a haircut. The, I'm, so keep in mind, there is a difference between me saying, You're, you are looking for stocks going to zero. That does not necessarily mean the business ceases to exist. Other questions? Yeah. Hey, go ahead. Yeah, just speak uh, up. So Yeah. Is, is that a potential factor to turn around the market and kind of what's your long view on the market? The yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Um, anytime you're looking at loan bubbles, the obvious analogy is, is you're looking for 08, right? Um, it, you know, the European banks still haven't cleaned up their um, loan books, for example, unlike the U.S. banks. And you have to be careful because 08 was unusual. Most, most bubbles... Like the, I just read a pretty articulate thesis that the auto uh, auto loans um, um, are that there's a bubble there as well, and uh, it was the investor letter from a guy named Arnie Olson. Actually, if you go to my email today, if you go to EmpireFinancialResearch.com, you can sign up. I have a free uh, email that goes out every weekday at about 1 p.m. Just with, hey, I was at this conference. Here's some interesting stuff I thought uh, I saw. Um, and in this case, I read an interesting um, uh, Q4 letter from a guy I used to know 20 years ago named Arnie Olson of Worm Capital, um, which uh, I'm sure none of you have ever heard of. But he makes a pretty interesting long case on Tesla. But as part, at the end of his letter, he made an interesting short case on Santander Consumer, which is a publicly traded stock here because of their exposure to um, auto loans, right? So the two things that blew up the world in 08, it wasn't just about a lot of bad loans. It was fraud, massive widespread fraud um, in, in these loans. Okay, so it wasn't just they weren't charging a high enough interest rate um, and some people defaulted. It was massive fraud, okay? And uh, the second thing that blew the world up, that really blew the world up, was all the side bets. It was the off-balance sheet stuff. It was AIG's uh, rogue London office writing credit default swaps to Mike Burry and John Paulson, which had triggers, which upon a downgrade, they instantly had to put up billions of dollars in cash, right? So it, was the, it, was, it wasn't the one trillion dollars of subprime loans that blew up the world. It was the five trillion dollars of side bets on the one trillion dollars of loans that nobody knew about the five trillion that blew up the world. I'm, it's broader than that, but very, but so that's the thing you have to be careful of. So I, I've sort of read the student loans. The other problem with student loans, a couple problems is, is I don't know how many public companies are there that you could play it with, right? Whereas, you know, during the, during the housing bubble, there were a hundred companies. It was all the mortgage insurers, all the investment banks, all the commercial banks, et cetera. It's all, all the home builders. There were hundreds of stocks, right? And you need, you want a well-diversified portfolio. So that's one problem with trying to short the student sector. The other problem is, is the government's insuring most of these, right? They're 90% of that sector. So that's sort of hard. Um, so um, so I, I, I think there are definitely going to be problems. I think we, the taxpayer, are mostly on the hook for it. Um, I have not looked closely um, uh, at, uh, at any of the public companies. Do you have a particular public company in mind you know, that no, you think is a good short? Just, just yeah. Hop on topic and 
Yeah, yeah. The, the one caution, I generally think looking for bubbles where lending has gotten really crappy um, is in, in, uh, in financials is generally a pretty interesting place to look. I would just caution you that 2008 was pretty unique in its size, um, in the amount of fraud that took place, and the amount of leverage, hidden leverage. Not, it's, it's what people can't see and get blindsided by. That, that blew up the world, not the, not the losses on what they knew about. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, my question is three part. First part is uh, how are you going to stay with your strategy when you make one? The second part is when you're making the strategy or when you're making the decision, how do you question yourself? The third part is how, when you decide to give up. Okay, so your first question is, is just do, um, your thoughts on developing an investment strategy. Yeah, when you're yeah, when you choosing a target or when you're making a strategy, are you gonna just keep staying with it, or you just you know maybe sometimes you know what I, I don't follow my strategy, I just do what I really want. Yeah. Now, is your question related to you know making a specific investment on a specific stock, or are you yeah. talking about yes. look if I'm gonna manage if I'm gonna go out there and start my own hedge fund or something, mm -hmm. having a differentiated strategy um, is is a very important part of that that you can communicate to potential investors uh, and that makes sense, that's rooted in some particular knowledge or skill set or approach that you have. Um, is that, because uh, yes, I think that's a, because I mean, even if you aren't o opening up your own fund, if you're just going to apply for a job somewhere, if you want to work where, which is where 90% of people or 99% of people end up as opposed to running their own fund, um, being able to articulate sort of what your strategy is, where you have an edge. Uh, is pretty darn important, and you should think about that. Look, if you're, even if you're not doing this professionally, if you're just picking stocks on your own, you're competing against an awful lot of smart people and an awful lot of smart supercomputers, increasingly smart supercomputers, right? So um, thinking about, okay, where do I have an edge? So, you know, looking around this room, I see a lot of people who my guess is, is were born and raised in other countries, not here in the United States. It may be half the people in this room, right? Um, that's an obvious place to look. The U.S. market is the largest and most efficient in the world. Um, and if you uh, are from another country, speak another language, and can hunt in less efficient markets, uh, that is a huge edge. And I'd urge you to take advantage of that. That's certainly a clear way to differentiate yourself. Now, you know, um, it's... Uh, you better have more of a stomach for volatility. You better have a better nose for fraud because you know anywhere outside the United States, um, the odds of fraud go up dramatically. Uh, so you know some of these more emerging, you know the Chinese market. I never really invested in just because it was too much of the wild west, and I I figured I would be the the last guy on earth to know I was being defrauded, right? Um, so, uh, but look, I think China and India are two of the largest economies and, uh, and there's going to be a lot of growth there and there, I'm sure there are a lot of great companies there if you avoid the 20 biggest companies. Like if you come in to be pitching for a job, hey, I really like Alibaba and I'm Chinese and so I know something about Alibaba, I was like, yeah, no you don't. Uh, you know, it's the most widely followed stock in China probably, right? Um, go find me the next Alibaba. Uh, you know, I'm interested in that, right? So, uh, um, so similarly, um, you know, I've read enough investment letters from guys from India investing in India that uh, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, uh, there was once a young guy who's from Israel. Israel has a small stock market, but he was from there, grew up there, speaks the language. And here's what's interesting: outside of the top 20 companies, nobody reports in English. It's true of Korea, Japan, a lot of a lot of countries. So you've got to speak the language to invest there, um, and that's a huge advantage he had in Israel. That was true in Israel. And, but he was starting up his fund, and I uh, occasionally invested some money seeding new funds and took a stake in the GP, like hedge fund venture capital. I did a little bit of that on the side. And he was pitching me. I thought he was a smart guy. Um, but he was, I asked, okay, so show me your five largest positions. Uh, then it was Berkshire Hathaway and Fairfax and whatever. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, wh where do you have an advantage? Living in Tel Aviv, owning Canadian Fairfax and Omaha, Berkshire Hathaway, this is ridiculous. And I tried to persuade him 
that I'll, I'll invest with you if you're gonna have an Israel-focused strategy because I believe that's an inefficient market where a small fund investing in the smaller Israeli companies where you speak the language, can go meet with management, you know, are plugged in, you know, when, where to the scuttlebutt where, yeah, that stock looks cheap, but the guys running the company are complete criminals, right? I would never know that, but he would know that, right? So that makes sense. So think about that, right? Think about, think about um, in a, less efficient markets where you might be able to develop some expertise and have an edge, um, ideally in countries where there's, you know, there's some growth potential and all. Like one guy I met years ago, he, he was in a rock-focused fund, um, and it was the ultimate frontier market. Uh, but I don't know how the fund is done. This was, I don't know, many years ago, but you know, I can't imagine it's done very well. There were only, I don't know, 10 publicly traded stocks, and he was not a rocky. Uh, you know, so, so just because it's an inefficient market doesn't mean that's the market you should be pursuing. Other questions? Uh, sure. What's your opinion on all the antitrust uh, investigations that are happening? Like what? Like I hear, I hear a lot of talk about uh, antitrust investigations into Google and Amazon. Uh, um, What's your opinion? Well, look, my general opinion is the antitrust regulators have been completely at the switch, uh, asleep at the switch, for 30 years since Reagan, since 1980, 40 years. You know, the average American cell phone bill is thirty dollars, forty, fifty. I forget what the number is. Then the average person in Europe, and we have shittier service because we allow this industry to consolidate. Um, um, so that's a whole another rant. Um, uh, so I'm going to get to your question, which is specific, I think, to some of the tech giants and sh should they be broken up? Um, not, sure I, they, not sure they, but how do you how do you view it going forward? And yeah. My I view is, is look, personally, if I were czar, I would make, uh, it was insane to allow Facebook to acquire Instagram and WhatsApp, and I'd, I'd get them to uh, divest it immediately. I'd make Google divest YouTube. Um, oh, we've got to wrap up, last question. Um, um, uh, probably Waymo, um, Android. YouTube has seven businesses, seven different bus uh, businesses that have over a billion monthly average users. Um, and, um, oh, I'd break that all up. i break, I, I, I see absolutely no reason. I, I think Jeff Bezos and what he's created Amazon is one of the great miracles of capitalism. And, you know, the business he's created has uh, been astonishing. On the other hand, the power of Amazon uh, combined with now owning Amazon Web Services, um, I'd, I'd, I'd force the split up of that. That would be my, I think we would have a much healthier economy. Um, if all that were happening. Do I think any of that's going to happen? No, and I think Amazon's a good long. I think Facebook is a good long. I think Google is a good long. Uh, so uh, um, I think, uh, 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 so don't get me started on the failure of antitrust uh, in this country. Uh, I think it's actually had a, a significant impact on general income inequality, et cetera, but it's been great for capitalists and shareholders. It's just screwed everybody else. Um, and, you know, look, if Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren becomes president, that might change. Uh, uh, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, I think that would be pretty high on their agenda, reigning in the tech giants in general and rigorously enforcing antitrust going forward. Would they go back and require breakups and so forth? They might have a tough legal road to hoe there, given a Supreme Court and a judiciary that's increasingly right-wing. A left-wing president can be able to go back and retroactively change what happened probably, but so um, I guess those are my thoughts. Uh, thank you all very much. I'll, I'm sticking around. We're having a <laughs> I'll see everybody outside. I just want to take the time and thank the Private Equity Club, the Finance Society, Mullen Meta, Abney Newman, and Lonnie Houston. Thank you guys. See you outside.